So today's text is one of my favorites. These wonderful metaphors for what discipleship is and what it looks like. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. As hyper-individualists as many of us are, we hear that in the singular, but in fact, the you here is the plural form. So Jesus is saying, you all, we, are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Jesus is saying, as the message translation says so beautifully, that we are the people God is calling to bring out the God flavors in the world, like salt. And we are the people who are called to go out and bring God's colors and help others to see the beauty of all of God's creation and all of God's creatures. Like salt, we're called not to make it about us, but we are called to dissolve into the broth, bringing forth the flavors that are there in the same way that light does not draw attention to itself but shines light on others. So we are called to shine the light upon this world so that more people will see God's presence and God's movement in the world. But in our text, Jesus also warns us. There's a warning here. We can only do that if we remain salty. And I'll describe what that means. We can only do that if we allow that light to shine more brightly in us and in our community. In other words, we got to work at this salt thing. we got to work at this light thing. It doesn't just happen. So how does it happen? Here's the simple answer which will break down a little bit. We gotta keep growing. We have to keep maturing as a community of faith. To paraphrase my favorite singer-songwriter, we gotta be busy being born or we'll get busy dying. Or to paraphrase my favorite reformer, we have to be the church reformed and always reforming. Or to paraphrase my favorite Hindu, we have to be the change we wish to see in the world. That's what Jesus is getting at when he says, I have come not to abolish the tradition, not to get rid of the law, no, but to help us fulfill our mission. He is saying the law is important, but what's more important is the transformative power at the heart of the law that gave birth to the law and has gave birth to our tradition of which we are the next generation of. Jesus understands that the law is not a victory prize for the elect. It's training wheels on the way to maturity. Jesus says something pretty powerful. He says, unless your righteousness, unless my righteousness, our righteousness exceeds that of the religious leaders of his time, The scribes and the Pharisees, unless that happens, we'll never see, we'll never enter the kingdom, we'll never be able to recognize God's presence in this world and where God is leading us. Why is that? Matthew says it clearly later in the gospel. Those people don't practice what they preach. They do things in order to be seen by others. They love to be seen as important They gravitate to those seats of honor. They desire the praise of the people. In other words, they've forgotten that they're not the main course. They're the salt. They've forgotten that the light was not supposed to shine on them. It's supposed to shine on the people. That's where Jesus is leading us. He's leading us from ego-centeredness to God-centeredness. He's leading us from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. That's where it's headed for all of us. That's what the community ought to be about in the world. That's what healthy religion looks like. Healthy religion leads us from narcissism towards altruism. Unhealthy religion keeps us stuck 
in that vicious narcissistic cycle, and we all know what that feels like. And we've seen so many examples in our world. Ken Wilbur has developed a theory, a stage theory called spiral dynamics, which has been incredibly helpful to me in order to frame what's going on in our culture and what's going on in our world. And he talks about the stages that we must go through to move from narcissism to altruism. Now, he has studied Christianity. He is a great friend of Christianity, although he's a practicing Buddhist. He's looked at all the great religions, and he's been looking for the themes, looking at the best examples within those religions, and why is it that they've come to that level of consciousness? He's also studied science, the best in neuroscience, the best in biology, the best in psychology, and he's developed this theory called spiral dynamics. And here's the basic idea, that we go through stages, and each stage has its gift. We have to claim that gift, and we ought never let go of that gift. But each stage has its limits, and we must transcend those limits in order to mature, in order to move on to the next stage. And so there's this process of continuing to work through the limitations towards a higher level, but bringing forth the best. Now this, in science, can be understood as the cell moving forward, but including the molecule that it transcended, or a molecule moving forward and calling forward the atom which is, it has transcended. This is the way reality works in the world, and it's the way reality works in the church. The most mature people are those who have integrated the best of each stage of development. So let's take a quick journey through these stages. We all begin at the beginning, the purple stage of development, which is called the magical stage. At this period in our lives, we try to coax or control reality or God for our own selfish purposes. So we say our evening prayers to try to get God to execute our agenda. This is how I want it to happen, God. That's how we pray. Or we wear a cross to try to earn God's good graces. We all started here. And it's actually a good stage because it gets us started on the journey. It initiates us into the community, into the practice that we need. And hopefully we begin to realize God doesn't, that we can't control God. That it's not about our ego, our agenda. Hopefully we begin to learn that wearing the right thing doesn't earn God's graces because we already are in God's grace. But hopefully we don't throw away the importance of ritual and practice and even symbols that can keep our minds and our hearts focused on things that are important. The purple stage. The next stage is the red stage, which is about the tribe. We enter into the tribe. We submit ourselves to certain beliefs held by the tribe. We experience a deeper sense of belonging beyond our family of origin. We belong to other families, and this becomes like a family. We are surrounded in this family with elders and mentors with Sunday school teachers who encourage us and support us and inspire us on the journey of faith. And over time, we receive lots of blessings from being part of the community, being part of the tribe. But at some point, we realize that the tribe's faith can't be a substitute for our own. God has no grandchildren, only children. And each of us must develop our own relationship with God and the unique texture of that relationship. But hopefully as we evolve and we move forward, we recognize that loyalty to a tribe and tradition is a good thing, but it's not the only thing. Which leads to the blue stage, which is about creeds and moral codes. Here we begin to discover that the tribe contains trustworthy sources of meaning and purpose and direction, and these things hold us together, and they hold things together. At this stage, we become apprentices 
And we begin to learn the creeds and the moral codes. We learn the system, the tribe system of belief. And this gives us good, healthy food to chew on. And we begin to work with these things. And it gives our lives meaning and purpose and direction. But what begins to happen at this stage is we start to think, wait a second. We're not always doing this. And that leader, he's not always doing it either. And we begin to question whether the tribe is living up to its ideals. And we begin to see there's something more than just marching in lockstep with our tribe. Now, this is where many churches and many institutions, pay attention here, get stuck at the blue level. Now, this is really likely to happen when there is a strong culture of conformity and it is so strong that people are afraid to speak up or they're expelled from the community or the tribe when they do speak up. Here's the irony. That in order for a community to move beyond the blue level, some members within the community have to have been wounded by the community, or by a leader in the community, or by some particular teaching of that community. Some people within that tribe had to have experienced a suffering that often came as a result of the tribe culture, or they've had some experience of suffering that the tribe is not able to help them to frame. Something that helps them to see the insufficiency of the tribe for itself. A church or an institution can only move to the orange level if the wounded ones, rather than walk away in anger or disillusionment, choose to hang in there and to stay. And not everyone can do that. We need people willing to take the risk of being part of the church and being part of the change they wish to see in the church. We need people who are willing to challenge the tribe and the tribal leaders and to ask hard and honest questions about whether or not we're living faithfully to the ideals that we hold. And that's what these people do at their best. They use the very teachings within the tribe to challenge the tribe to raise to a higher level of consciousness. And that's what we'll be doing, Lent. We spend time in Lent with the hardest things in the Gospels. We will spend all of Lent working on the Beatitudes. This is hard stuff. And we will be asking, how well are we doing living this out? How well are we doing following in the footsteps of Jesus? How well are we doing being little Christs in the world? This is what leads a tribe to the orange level, which is about the individual. Here at the orange stage, we discover and we claim our personal power to shape the tribe and to make a lasting impact on the tribe. Here we discover that within the tribe there are these deeper and hidden gems, treasures, Here we discover that we aren't the only ones who've been asking these questions. People have been asking these questions for generations. And there are people all over the world asking the same questions. And we begin to to feel connected to a new group who's been asking important, profound questions. And we realize there's always been this conversation happening which hasn't been highlighted because it doesn't necessarily serve the self-interest of the tribal leaders or the tribe or the institution. But again, hopefully, we don't get angry or disillusioned to the point where we walk away from it all. Hopefully, we stay connected because we are part of the cutting edge of leading that tribe to a higher level. And so the invitation is to grow more patient, to be more persistent, to be able to persevere, and to be both bold and humble at the same time. Now, if I had to guess, this is where West Side is. But who am I to say? I think we've moved beyond the blue level. That's probably why most of us are here, right? We're probably living out the orange level, which is messy, as every stage is. 
So as a practical matter, we take the Bible really seriously, but we don't believe the Bible is God. We believe the Bible points to God. As a practical matter, we celebrate our history and our tradition, but we realize we've gotten it wrong. We've had many blind spots, and we still do. We focus a little bit less on right beliefs, although those are always important. We focus more on right action, on whether or not the tribe is following in the footsteps of Jesus. We realize that we are an instrument of Jesus Christ in the world, but we are imperfect. We don't have all the answers. But here's the thing. There's other stages beyond the orange stage. And many argue that it's impossible for a group or an institution to move collectively to another level. I don't know if that's true. But, but I think the gift of the orange level is we begin to make space for people to move to higher levels. Space for individuals, smaller communities within the larger community to move beyond the orange level. And I think some of this has been happening here for a long time. And it should be noted, this is messy because this type of elevating of the community is not always well received. A lot of people who are a level above us or two are hard to understand. We kind of dismiss them. We think they're a little crazy, a little woo-woo. And it's probably true that we can't understand somebody that's more than one level above us. We label these people. That's what they did to Jesus. He's weird. He's heretical. He's dangerous. We've got to get rid of him. But hopefully the orange community is healthy enough is that we make space for that because the next stage is the green stage. And here we begin to let go of our need for our tribe to be superior to everybody else. We begin to see that these categories of black and white, good and bad, which have served us to a point in the end prevent us from seeing more clearly that there are other tribes and they're doing some great work. And there are other parts of our tribe that actually aren't really helping the world very much. And over time, we become interested in the tribes that are doing work that shares our values. And we might even want to start partnering with some of those because they're doing good stuff. Jesus said, if you're not against us, you're for us. The green level begins to move us out back into the community. This is the civil rights movement, which was a green stage movement led by groups of tribes coming together, working towards individual rights, civil rights. But here's the temptation at the green level, that we don't fall in the trap of moral equivalency, that we continue to see, yes, there are still good tribes and better tribes. There are still bad tribes and better tribes, that we don't lose that capacity to be discerning. This is the most dangerous level and one that many individuals get stuck at. Ken Wilber clearly, cleverly calls the dark side of the green stage boomeritis. Now, I cannot say that as a Gen Xer. He's a fellow baby boomer, so he's slamming the baby boomers. He says these people have a toxic combination of arrogance and individualism. He calls them the mean greens. They have just enough enlightenment to reject everybody below them as naive and not enough enlightenment to realize that there are people more evolved and mature than they are. And so they dismiss all that other stuff as woo-woo. Maybe you can hear yourself a little bit in that. I can definitely hear me. And this arrogance, this individualism keeps people stuck at the green level. And the reality is there are levels that are more mature and more evolved than the green. In fact, there's an entire tier. The green level is the most evolved of the first tier of consciousness. There's a second tier, which is the mystical, the non-dual consciousness. That's the consciousness of Jesus, the Buddha, the enlightened one. And here's the thing, education can't get us there. More information can't get us there. The only thing that leads us there is transformation. That's the point that Jesus is making with the scribes and the Pharisees. They are the most well-educated of all. And they're incredibly immature and self-centered and ego-centered. The only thing powerful enough to move us to the, to the uh, 
The next level is some experience of death. Ego death. Something that goes horribly wrong in our lives or something that goes horribly right and we end up having to change everything. Oftentimes a family with a special needs kid can lead us there. Some experience of profound loss can lead us into a dark night of the soul and we go there kicking and screaming because a big change can happen there that can't happen anywhere else and we come upon the limits of our human resources and our rational mind and we stumble upon the reality of the spirit which has always been there and always will. We go there kicking and screaming because it feels like death and it is. This is Paul, or Saul, on the way to Damascus. This is Martin Luther King Jr. at his kitchen table after his life has been threatened and he's praying sweats of blood. This is Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the tempter. These transformative experiences, if we stay open to them, if we stay faithful, can unleash New levels of creativity, compassion, grace, and wisdom. People who evolve to the second tier consciousness have the humility to to include the value of every previous stage while also moving beyond that stage's limitations. Like Jesus, they come not to abolish every other stage, not to point out how horribly wrong every other stage is, but to fulfill where those stages were meant to lead us. These are the salty people who help us be the salt of the earth. These are the people in whom the fire of God's love and power burns bright, and they help a community shine even brighter if we don't marginalize them which is what we often do. These are people who we can trust with power and authority, but we often don't give it to them because they're not seeking it. These are the tribal elders in the Native American tradition. These are the sages in the Hindu tradition. These are the yogis of the Buddhist tradition. These are the elders of the Presbyterian experiment. To paraphrase Ken Wilber, these are the people who can activate red power drives and act decisively in emergency. They can activate blue order drives, bringing stability in times of great chaos. They can activate orange achievement drives, leading a community towards goals and a vision. They can activate green bonding power that helps the tribe connect with each other and connect with those beyond the tribe. So what the heck does all this mean? What helps us be salt? What helps us become light together? Well, according to Wilbur, there are some conveyor belts of transformation. I love that phrase. Here's three of them. Contemplative prayer. Sitting in the presence of God, not telling God what to do and how to run things, but making yourself available to being changed from the inside out. That's contemplative prayer. Number two, apprenticeship. Learning to surround yourself with people who are more evolved and mature than you are so that you can grow and learn from their example. And the third is an experience of great love or great suffering. And they often come together. Why do parents with little kids come back to church? Yeah, to baptize. You can be cynical about it. But here's the deeper reason, I think. Because they realize, oh my God, I'm I'm entrusted with this precious gift. And I don't know how to do this. There's an opening at that moment in our lives where we realize what this could be about. Now, maybe you've noticed we're doing some of this. We're trying to weave contemplative prayer into everything we do. We've begun the West Side Story 2.0 initiative. We spent an hour yesterday in prayer asking God, what do you want to do with us? 
What do you have in store in mind for us? We are providing space for people to learn from each other, to journey together in deep ways, to apprentice one another. And I hope we're giving people permission. I'm giving you permission at the least to be real, to be honest about life and your experience of life. Hopefully we're creating a community where we don't have to BS each other. We don't have to pretend everything's perfect. Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Everything's perfect. Marriage is great. The kids are great. I mean, we all have enough of that, right? There are so many examples of unhealthy religion. And all that does is it keeps us stuck in narcissism. And Jesus came to free us from that prison. To lead us out of the prison of of our narcissism towards an altruism that connects us with the Holy Spirit, connects us with people, connects us to those who can teach us so much because they've suffered so much and yet they still love so much. So Lord, may you continue to lead us as a people Help us not to abolish the past, abolish our tradition, our history, but lead us in the better way. Help us to follow in your footsteps, to learn how to see with your eyes and to be an instrument of your love and power, to be bold and humble. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.